Well, as we turn our attention to God's Word, uh, I would ask you to uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. Uh, there's a there's a an issue that should be clarified over and over, I think, because it's cause it causes confusion today and it causes confusion, it's caused confusion throughout the history of the church, and that is and I, and I should say it'll help orient us to what to even do with the Proverbs, okay? And that is the relationship between belief and behavior. The relationship between belief and behavior. And you've got sort of two extremes. On one side, uh, you've got to behave in order to be in good with God. You have to behave a certain way. Then God will accept you. Then you can get into heaven. You ask the person here, will you be in heaven? I hope so, but I'm not sure. Why? Because what if I sinned a lot the day before I die? What if my behavior it doesn't, my good behavior doesn't outweigh the bad behavior, and so they don't really have hope here. And so the person in this camp, they start following God, or they think they're following God, but they can derail quickly, and now they're not in with God. And then they've got to do something and get back in, and enough behavior to get back in. They struggle to define how much behavior is enough behavior, but they just struggle with this idea that you've got to behave, right? You've got another extreme, though, don't you, where it's by belief. It's faith alone. Behavior doesn't save you. Faith saves you. That's true, but the reason why I put them over here is because they take it a step further and go, so behavior doesn't really, doesn't really matter that much. Behavior doesn't keep you in. Behavior doesn't kick you out. So you've got Christians that behave badly and Christians that behave well, but they're all saved because at least they have belief. And that's not true either. Why is this relevant to Proverbs? Because this group, they really need a book like Proverbs. I need a book that guides me on how to live because if I don't, I'll die. I've got to earn that spot with God. I've got to stay on the path and not fall off, and that staying on the path is by my behavior, the the driving behaviors that keep me on the path. This side over here, well, we don't really need the Proverbs because Proverbs are a lot about behavior, and it's belief alone, faith alone. So it's not that big of a deal. Now, they may not say they don't need the Proverbs, but if you ask them, how much do you read the Old Testament? Eh, a lot of law. Proverbs sound like law. A lot of the Proverbs, it's, it's applying the law to, to actual life. That's wisdom. And so this camp, you know, there's, there's not a lot of room for rules, do's and don'ts. As soon as you pull out a do and don't, they, they cry legalism. But the reality is somewhere right here where belief and behavior join. And how do belief and behavior join? This is important. You have Catholic friends. You grow up with a fundamental Baptist background. Right? And then what do their kids do? Dump it and go the other way? You, you, any person you talk to, they're, gonna, they're struggling which camp to be in. The relationship between belief and behavior is that belief produces behavior. Belief precedes behavior. But belief doesn't make behavior a, a, a no, no, of no importance. Behavior is important. Not because it earns a spot with God, but because it proves that you've got that spot with God. If you have belief, belief looks a certain way. Belief comes out, it it pours out in your life and looks a certain way. And throughout scripture, we are warned, we are warned that if you think you've got belief, let's call it wisdom, the wisdom of God, because what's the beginning of wisdom? Knowing God, fearing God, having that relationship with God. If you think you've got belief, show me in your behavior. That's James. That's James. And people are like, James is weird. I prefer Paul. Do you? How many do's and don'ts does Paul have in his letters? Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't take communion the wrong way. You'll die. That's Paul. But what Paul is making clear is that it starts with belief, and belief drives the behavior. Why was Abraham the type of person that would obey God even to the point of sacrificing his own son? 
Genesis tells us he believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Belief drove behavior for Abraham and everybody through the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. If you're not familiar with that, go look it up. It goes through characters in the Old Testament, and some of them are gnarly characters, man. They're not, they're not all, they're not all the, the shining beacons of righteousness. But you can point to a time in their life where belief drove behavior, and that's the point. So as we look at the Proverbs, we're not looking at it over here where it's, I've got to follow the Proverbs in order to, you know, become a righteous person. But we don't want to be over here where we go, well, I'm already a righteous person, so what's the big deal whether I read the Bible, study the Bible, memorize it, handle my finances a certain way, parent a certain way, or listen to my parents a certain way. It just doesn't really matter that much, you know, because I'm in. The reality is right here. Because if that person is still trying to earn it, then that person is not in. And if this person thinks that because they don't have to earn it, they don't have to live a certain way, they're not in. The person that's in, the person that has fellowship in the light, lives like they're in the light. Right? And what the Proverbs do is they serve as a call, as a warning for you to live a certain way. Because if you step off the path, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. Because you can be lost. You can be lost. Parents raise their kids, and kids, they go off to college, and aren't we kind of like, Ugh. it's like the, the fledgling bird out of the nest, and we're like, I hope they fly, because I can't control it. You're out now. It's, it's, on, it's between you and the Lord. So it's not guaranteed. And so we recognize this idea that at any given time, Someone could experience a derailment, a going off of the path. And some Christians say, well, they lost their salvation. But I think the truth is it exposes whether they already had faith for real or not. Because real faith looks a certain way. So what I'm trying to say is this. When you understand that belief drives behavior, behavior matters to you. You don't get to say because belief is what counts, behavior doesn't matter. Behavior does matter. Behavior does matter because it shows that you actually have belief. Now, the Proverbs are assuming you're in with belief. A father speaking to the son, this is underneath the covenant of God. This is a family table talk, okay? And he's calling the sons to the table, and as a father, he's saying, in this house, we live a certain way. That house is covenant relationship with God. So he's assuming, as the reader, you're in. Now, if you're not in, well, you're welcome to listen from the outside. And I extended the invitation to you to Christ uh, a few moments ago during the Lord's Supper. Talk to any of us afterwards if you have more questions about it. So the Proverbs are not shouting to you, here's how you get to the table, live wisely. It's talking to people who already are in belief. They have this belief. They're in the house. And he's saying, hey, we live a certain way in this house. We live a certain way in this house. Like when I talk to my kids, I'm like, you're an O'Neill. You wear that name, you live a certain way, and live into that name. And the Proverbs are doing exactly that. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. If we have this belief, that belief produces and drives certain behaviors in our lives. In our lives, And those behaviors keep us, guard us, protect us from strain, from going out of the house, from leaving the table. Let's look at verses 1 through 13 to see how wisdom guards our path. It says, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget. And do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear, my son, and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. 
I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Before we move into the second half of chapter 4, let me point out a few things just to reemphasize this idea. He wants you to chase wisdom, get wisdom, go after wisdom, secure wisdom. And if you do, wisdom will in turn protect you, guard you, cover you, keep you from falling away, from falling off the path. In the first five verses, it's this uh, sweet moment of a father calling sons together to be attentive, to be attentive, to gain insight. Uh, You know, some of you grew up with hearing a lot of lectures from your parents. Um, And so when your kids are like, oh, another lecture, you're like, I know, I don't want to become my dad. And so you kind of lay off the lectures. Lecture! You're hearing it from me. I'm telling you, lecture your kids. Because that's your job. But lecture them with wisdom and not just going off on uh, tantrums. It's a time to bestow what is true and what is faithful and what is righteous to your children. And so that's what he's doing. He's calling us, the readers, we're kind of in this position of children before the author of Proverbs. It's God's word, so God calling us to hear him. Why? Because I give you good precepts. I want you to gain insight, verse 1, verse 2, precepts. Don't forsake it. When I was a son with my father, tender, The only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me. So he's saying, I got it when I was young, tender, impressionable. You know, as we get older, it's harder to teach us things. And the Proverbs are basically saying, that's why it's important to get it young. Now, what I tell you, you might be chronologically old, but if the Lord massages your heart to be spiritually young, you can... Be impressionable enough to subject yourself to scripture and learn the new thing that will guard you and that will keep you. It doesn't matter if you've been doing something the same way for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. If that's not the wise way, stop and embrace a new way. Is it hard to do? Yeah, it's hard to do. But we need wisdom to do it. And we need to make sure we don't forsake the teaching. Some of us did get truths when we were young and impressionable And somewhere along the way, we thought we got smarter or wiser, and we need to return to some of those truths that we learned when we were young. How do we know which ones we were taught that were true and which ones we should hold to? Well, the ones that are scriptural, the ones that are wise, the ones that are true. We know that by exposing ourselves to God's word. And then our hearts hold fast to those words. They're commandments, and we keep them. We keep them, and we live. Now, it's interesting because there, one camp, right there, verse 4, they'd be like, see, keep the commandments, and then you live. So you have to do the behavior, otherwise you don't live. Well, not exactly. If you drop down to verse 7, I'm going to remind you of a truth that we saw in the first three chapters of Proverbs. He says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Now, if that wasn't in Scripture, I'd be like, that's, I don't want to say dumb, but like, well, that doesn't make sense. Here's, here's how you get wisdom. Here's the beginning of wisdom. Here's the start. Yes, thank you. I got my pen out. I don't have wisdom. I need wisdom. How do I get it? Here's how you get wisdom. Here's the beginning of it. Get wisdom. I think what the Proverbs are emphasizing is it takes wisdom to go get wisdom. And this is where I remind you, if you wait until you become wise to say, okay, now I'm in with God, you'll never get there. Because something has to happen here first. The desire to go get it. And what he's saying, if you want to be wise, if you want to be wise, go get it then. You know why you don't have wisdom? You don't want to go get it. You don't have wisdom to begin with. You don't fear the Lord. You're not a worshiper. So it starts with God, not what God is going to tell you about finances. We don't use God to choose stocks. 
You don't use God to get a promotion. This is what's so backwards about the prosperity gospel, isn't it? They want wisdom from God to do certain things in life so that they remain central to life. But that's not real wisdom because the beginning of wisdom is not me. The beginning of wisdom is fearing God first. And the person who does that seeks real wisdom and they want to go get it. The Hebrew word for get, get wisdom, it's buy. Buy wisdom, go purchase it. And I understand why the ESV, I didn't take a, a, a survey of English translations, but I understand why the ESV went with get. Because if you read buy, you'd be like, buy, buy where? How much? Anytime you hear the word buy, you'd be like, where and how much? How, where, do I, where can I get it? Where is it available? And how much is it? And I think those would be the wrong questions to ask, especially the second one, how much is it, right? That's not what the, the author is after. What the author is after is when you purchase something, you really wanted that something. You know what I mean? If somebody gives you something, you maybe want it or didn't want it, but out of respect to the person, you just take it. You're like, okay, I'll take it. But if you're going to spend hard-earned cash and go buy the thing, it's because you want it. And so what the author is after with the word buy or purchase is not transactional. You give God something, then he gives you wisdom. Transactional is not what it's after, but worth. The treasure of it. The, the pursuit of it. It's worth something to you, and so you go get it, even if it costs you something. That's, that's the idea behind it. Get wisdom, purchase wisdom, buy wisdom. Even if it's costly, it's worth more to you than anything else, and you go get it. You go get insight. You don't forget it, verse 5. You don't turn away from it. In the case we're forgetting what wisdom is, it's not a feeling. It's not a moment of random discernment. It's words. It's words. Some of us are like, man, I really wish God guided me more in my life. When's the last time you read your Bible? I don't know, like eight years ago? Words. Don't wait for a feeling, a dream, a funny-shaped cloud on your way to work. Words. And so we pour over Scripture, and we recognize that God has given us something here that's sufficient for us. That's where we gain wisdom and insight. They are words. Their precepts, verse 2, instruction, verse 1, their commandments, verse 4. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but as I'm seeing it, these different kinds of words communicate to us that it's actual content. Wisdom has actual content to it. Verse 6, we don't forsake it. If we don't forsake her, wisdom, all those words, all those commandments, then she will keep you. Love her. And she will guard you. How often do we, especially in our culture, think of love as something that happens to us? I fell in love. Oops. Could care less about her. And then I can't stop thinking about her. It happened to me. And so at least one culture invented a little flying chubby child with a bow and arrow. And you were just walking along, minding your own business. And then pff, Cupid shot you in the heart. You're like, oh, man, I just can't stop thinking about this person. It happened to you, right? That's not scriptural. Why would God say, love the Lord your God with all your heart? Ah, it's just, that just hasn't happened to me yet, God. Oh, it's a command, sorry. Just to clear that up, it's a command. Can you choose to love? Yeah, that's what love is, actually, biblically speaking. You, you go through with it. You set your heart on something and choose love. That's how you don't forsake her. And that's how she will keep you. You love her and she, wisdom, will guard you. You get it. You go after it. Verse 7. And whatever you get, get insight. That's most important. Prize her highly and she will lift you up. She will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland like the winner at a, an Olympic event. You win. You win when she's number one for you. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. You reign, so to speak, right? You are lifted up. You're exalted. When others are falling off the path, you stay on the path. 
You were guarded and you were kept by this wisdom because you chased it and you guarded it. Accept these words, verse 10. Your life will be prolonged. Remember what you were taught, verse 11. You've been led in the paths of uprightness. You know this path. And when you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Get wisdom, and you won't fall off. The opposite is true. Get not wisdom, and you will fall off. That's where he goes in the next few verses, look at 14 and 19. There's a different kind of path. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Well, we see this here and we go, huh, yeah. I don't want to do what's wicked. Yeah, until the path in front of you is really not desirable, and that one is. I mean, the the wicked path is always the easier path, the broader path. Everyone is going down it. And yours, you're looking ahead, you're like, there's not a lot of people on this path. I feel kind of alone. Look at all the people going down that path. This path has rocks and hills, and it's it's uphill, it's steep, the sun is beating down on it. Look at this shady path. Look, they're handing out drinks down there. It's always going to look easier that other way. So it's easy when you're, you know, in the coffee, with your coffee in the morning, you're reading Proverbs 4, you're like, uh-huh, avoid the wicked. Yeah, exactly, avoid the wicked, right? It's easy when you look at it on the page. It's difficult when it's in real life. And the reason why it's difficult is because with your regular lenses, that doesn't look like a dark, evil path. How do I discern that that's dark and evil? Not by looking at the people living happy lives and their Facebook selves look like it's a way better life than my life. It's because when I look at scripture and I see God abhors that path. And whatever it looks like to my eyes, scripture teaches me that's the wrong path. And then he shows you this complete reversal. They are so steeped in the wrong path. They'll tell you this is great. Because they love it. Not only do they love it, they're addicted to it. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of anybody who has to take certain things in order to sleep well. I asked for a show of hands, but you know what I'm saying? They need a dose of evil before bed. Evil is their melatonin. Look at it right there. Verse 16. They cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. They want someone else to stumble along the path with them, and they won't sleep. They're not able to sleep until they can do it. Now think about the reversal. Have you ever had a restless night because you felt guilty over something? Bothers you. It weighs on your conscience. You toss and you turn. You're like, ah. They're the opposite. They toss and turn and they feel guilty about not having made someone stumble yet today. What the Proverbs are warning you is if you start going down this path, the things that are true will be subverted. Your life will look upside down. You'll love the wrong things. The wrong things will put you to sleep, will give you a sense of rest, a sense of peace. That's why he says they think they're good, but they're not. Verse 19, the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't know over what they stumble. To them, it sounds sleep, but in reality, they're stumbling. You should sleep sound on this path. That's difficult when you're faced with certain choices in life. It's what they eat. Verse 17, they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. They love it. They're addicted to it. They engorge themselves on it. From a distance, it looks like a really good meal. It's not. It'll kill you. It'll make you stumble. Stumble in verse 16. 
they stumble in verse 19, and they want you to join them. It's a path of darkness versus the path of righteousness. In verse 18, that's like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. I love that. In the moment, that path looks good. That's the dark path. But this path isn't exactly bright. Well, keep going, brother. Right? Keep going, sister. It's going to keep getting brighter. And as you continue on this path, you gain wisdom. You grow in wisdom. And the light keeps shining. And you see more. You're able to see more as you continue in it. Like the dawn rising and brightening your life with wisdom. So here's the point of Proverbs chapter 4. I would say pay attention to wisdom and your path will be sure. That's simple, right? Pay attention to wisdom and your path will be sure. But I want to say pay zealous attention to wisdom and your path will be sure. Because you're not going to stay on the path if you just kind of pay attention to wisdom. If you once in a while pay attention to wisdom. If you devote a little of yourself to wisdom. Look at the words that are used to keep you on the path, verses 20 to 27. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward. And your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Verse 27, do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Pay zealous attention to wisdom and your path will be sure. Your path will be straight. You will stay on the path. One commentator I was reading, Tremper Longman, pointed out that wisdom is not When you look at a passage like this, wisdom is not simply a decision, but wisdom is a long succession of decisions. It's it's this keeping at it aspect of wisdom, chasing it. So when you read, get wisdom, go get it, get insight, purchase it, don't forsake it. It's not go get it one time, put it on your shelf, and you're done. Back in 1994, I got wisdom. That, that, it's, it's this constant pursuit because it's a path. And the path keeps going. And dawn hasn't fully come yet. It's still happening. There's process and progress here. So that's why it's don't forget. Keep going. Guard it. She'll guard you. Love her. Not one time, but keep loving it and grow in that love. And then he uses these words to, to help you understand that you've got to intentionally And zealously chase it. Verse 20, be attentive. Be attentive. If any of you have ever taught a class of any age, and you see like people, and you're like, hey, (laughs) up here, right? Be attentive. That takes work from the student to pay attention. Incline your ear to my sayings. Now I want you to see how he involves the entire body here. I want you to put your whole body into this. So incline your ear in verse 20. Let them not escape from your sight. There are your eyes, verse 21. Keep them within your heart, verse 21. Verse 23, keep your heart with all vigilance. Eyes again in verse 25. Let your eyes uh, look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Your feet are involved in 26. Ponder the path of your feet. And don't swerve to the right or to the left. I skip the mouth in verse 24. Put away crooked speech and let devious talk be far from you. So eyes, heart, mouth, eyes again, feet. See? He could have just put it one way, but why all this imagery? Feet, your eyes, your ears. Just get it. Get it with everything. Pay attention. Incline your ears. Put your eyes directly ahead. Now, what I want to see from us is, continue to see from us and my own life as well, is the commitment to do it when you don't feel like doing it. Because I don't think this is talking about, hey, on those days where you wake up and you're like, man, I got a few extra minutes, I'm really bored, let me break my boredom with scripture. Or, 
uh, hey, you know, it's been a while. Let me, uh, I, I feel like it today. I feel like it today. Let me, let me read some scripture. There are going to be days where you don't feel like it. There are going to be a lot of days where you don't feel like it. And maybe a lot of us right now don't feel like it. Maybe you didn't even feel like coming today. And it was out of sheer habit that you came. And you might be tempted to feel guilty. I shouldn't have come out of habit. I shouldn't sing this song out of habit. It's so ritualistic. Rituals can be good. Because when your emotions aren't into it, you've got to train your mind and put your attention, just like the student in class. Hey, this guy is boring, but I'm going to pay attention, not because he wins my attention, but because I'm giving it intentionally. Some professors, you go to class, you're like, hey, man, that was awesome. I didn't even have to try to pay attention. I couldn't believe class was over when it was over. Other, other professors are giving you good content. You've got you to train your attention. So as a father instructing his son like a, a teacher would a student, Verse 20, be attentive to my words, incline your ear because you have the choice to do it. Not on the mornings you feel like it, but in those dry spells that you experience. Sometimes the only thing you have left is your commitment. To spend time in God's word. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, it is often when I open the Bible and I don't feel like reading it. But by the time I close the Bible, I was glad I did. And that's coming to you from a preacher. I have to read it, right? <laughs> but somewhere in there, God's words do something. And my heart is filled. Sometimes you might experience that that takes more than a moment. And you've got to open and close the Bible many times before your heart is into it again. Don't despair. Ask the Lord for at least the commitment to keep getting wisdom. It looks a little dark right now. It'll get brighter. Keep getting wisdom. Incline your ear. Look at verse 23. Keep your heart with vigilance. I love that. Be vigilant. Watchful. Pay attention to it. Verse 25. Look straight ahead. And your gaze be straight before you. Now, I don't know how many of you have spent much time walking like mountain paths, you know, and there's sticks and there's trees and there's rocks and there's divots and there's turns and the guide back there promised you that they put signs to tell you where to go and then the sign's crooked, lightning hit it, you know, it's missing, you don't know what's going on. You're trying to navigate this trail. So you're paying attention to navigating a trail, and you're also paying attention to your footing. And you can't pay attention to one at the expense of the other. You've got to look up and see where you're going. Does the trail go this way? Does the trail go that way? But you've got to look down and see stuff that you might trip on, right? Okay, I don't know if you, enough of y'all are outdoorsy or not. I don't know. You gotta watch. I mean, it happens in the city, too. I mean, I remember growing up in Jersey, we had the, the crookedest sidewalks we've ever seen in your life. Every slab was inches off. It was crazy. It was like a a Mario level, trying to get just walk home from the bus stop. But you got to look up, right? I'm switching it now. Those of you who lived in the city, you live in the city, do you walk like this? No, you don't. Like, got to look down because you trip. So it's both. And, and look at what the proverb, look what the, the father is telling his son. Look ahead, look directly forward, verse 25. Look ahead, look directly forward. Let your gaze be straight before you. Oh, watch your feet, though. Verse 26, ponder the path of your feet. The word there behind ponder is make level. Make level the path of your feet. I don't think he means get out a shovel and make it level. I think he means make sure you take a level step, a sure-footed step. All that is just to say watch where you're going, and it takes work to watch where you're going. At any moment, you can trip. At any moment, you can find what? What path am I on? Where, where am I here? Right? Watch where you're going. That's what wisdom does for you. It keeps you on the path. Not so you can earn a spot with God, but that's what somebody who's in fellowship with God does. They live lives where they pay attention to the path. And when you pay attention to the path, that path guards you. You'll look back and you're like, whoa, there was a cliff over there. You know what kept you from that cliff? Staying on the path, right? 
I don't know what situations you have in front of you in your lives, but we all are going to experience situations where, man, I don't feel like doing that, even though God tells me to do it. I really feel like doing this, even though God tells me don't do it. And when you wait till that moment, it's probably too late. You're right, you're going to step off that path. But if you're getting wisdom now, pursuing wisdom now, you're like, didn't you say this before? I know, this is going to be a series through Proverbs. And what is the main point? Get wisdom. So I want you to think, get practical. So when somebody asks you next Sunday, how do you get wisdom? I don't want to, you know, vague. When I read the Bible sometimes, even if Monday, Wednesday, Thursday at 3 o'clock, I read the Bible. Something, something to train your attention and keep your gaze ahead. And there's no magic formula. The answer is spend time in God's word. Spend time in praying God's word back to him. Those of you who have families, get your family around the Bible, not just movies, not just board games. Get around scripture. Fathers, mothers, lecture your kids, but give them good stuff. Not just when I was a kid, we didn't have that technology, you lazy bum. Pull out some scripture, you know. Talk about some scripture. I was reflecting on this this morning. Do you remember the sermon from last week? Do you remember the thing we talked about last time? What's your favorite verse? What have you read lately? And if the kid asks, I don't know, what would you read lately? Don't come up with nothing, right? Be like, well, I read this. This is what God is teaching me now. Those are the kind of practical things. If we don't sit down and go, I'm going to do it at this time. I'm going to make this plan, right, and then stick to it. We won't gain the wisdom we need to avoid those missteps in the future. So the homework is get wisdom. What that means is get in God's word. Let's pray.